We are parents, teachers, and educators. And like you, we're passionate about restoring our culture for Christ. This is Veritas Vox, the voice of classical Christian education. Hello again, this is Marlon Detweiler with Veritas Vox, the voice of classical Christian education. The hand that you just saw in front of the camera was Sarah Cartwright. <laughs> Sarah is joining us from Mississippi and teaches for Veritas Scholars Academy. She is the daughter of Mary Wright. I thought it very clever that she could find somebody with a last name that would be kind of like a derivative. Uh, Mary uh, uh, hails from, what's the lake name, Mary, that you live near? I live no, no longer. I, you're right. I never said I live near Lake Mead, but I still live near Lake Mead, but in Southern Utah now. We moved so she lives in here. Southern Utah now. We're <laughs> near Lake Mead. For those of you that don't know, and I was one of them, that's nothing. That's just a sophisticated way of avoiding saying I live near Las Vegas. <laughs> she didn't like being known for that, but she's a math teacher, and I'm still wondering what hours she uses for card counting at Blackjack. Maybe, maybe you can <laughs> test that on her. You are terrible. <laughs> Both of these women have taught for us at Veritas Scholars Academy for many years, uh, math primarily, but there may be some other things. Ladies, welcome. Uh, we're so glad to have you here. When did you both start with Veritas and what brought you to classical ed and to uh, Veritas? Sarah, I think the answer for you is mom, but so we'll start with Mary. Yes. Uh, okay, well, I um, what brought me I started with Veritas, first of all, when my oldest son started college, um, because I homeschooled all the way till college. So, um, and, and then what brought me there, I would say uh, getting a public school education, going into college and not being prepared. Um, that was a huge eye opener to me. I really just did not have the opportunity to learn the courses I need to take, to take Calc 1 even in college, um, in, my school did not offer. So I, I had to go uh, backpedal a little and learn on my own. Um, the teachers let me in anyway, and I was the top. I was the outstanding math student in my school, in my graduating class in high school. Um, so then I went on to college and, and then um, uh, taught uh, with my math degree, decided to teach in the Long Beach Unified School District for a few years. What a uh, eye-opening experience that was of what the government schools are. Man, 60% of the staff had PhDs, but so disillusioned, so ready to be anywhere but there in that government school. And I just thought, wow, I don't want my children in this situation. And so then as they as we actually had children and they grew a little, um, I started to look into online or not online at the time, um, just homeschooling and uh, found your catalog and all the wonderful okay. articles you put in that catalog because not only was it a catalog, but you taught a lot about the classical approach to education. I fell in love, loved it and used your curriculum all wonderful. the way through. Yeah, and yep. you've been teaching for us now 13, 14 years? Yeah, and I think it's, we think, no, nope, just 11. It's my 11th year. Okay. We yep. are about to start our 17th year of on, offering online classes, so you were very early on. Sarah, my understanding is when we got to know your mother, that you were at UNLV and a math major, and were you the number one math major in your school or the number one student in your class or both? Yes, yeah, so they have an award each year that they give to the top mathematics students called the Badniger Award and that was me at the university. I was super thankful and that mostly because of my mom really and my parents and that education that they were able to give me by God's grace. I know my mom as she explained didn't have those opportunities necessarily through that classical Christian worldview. And I absolutely loved it growing up homeschooled. I have wonderful memories. Hopefully some of those will come out in this, this podcast. It was a wonderful experience. And I feel like it did very well prepare me for university. And I love studying mathematics there. Then I studied abroad as part of that as well over in Scotland, where I met my husband, uh, Scott, who is some of you know, he's taught for very- well, He's teaching for us now too, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and he also, yeah, his day job also, he works with aircraft, so he's really enjoyed his physics background and 
I teach math and physics. Yeah, I can't believe it, but this is going to be my eighth year teaching for Unbelievable. Now back to college, it, there's no truth to the rumor that the book Bringing Down the House, which became the movie called 21, had anything to do with you. You weren't part of those, uh, no, of those card counting teams in Vegas. <laughs> Of course not. <laughs> all, all kidding aside. Would you just stop? <laughs> <laughs> well, all kidding aside, I actually know very well one of the people who does that. Wow. He has made a career of yeah. card counting in blackjack. I know him from competitive golf. And uh, he's been my partner in tournaments and he is a savant genius and uh, has made tens of millions of dollars card counting, which is not something that interests me at a personal level, but I find it fascinating and I love to hear when casinos yeah. are taken to the cleaners. <laughs> yeah, any of that. <laughs> so Sarah, you became aware of the opportunity of coming on with us and Mary, yours came through your own research. That's interesting. Now, this question is for both of you, and you can, uh, I know as mother and daughter, you're used to working together in these kinds of things, so uh, work it out. But some people think math is a waste of time in classical Christian yep. education. I know that. I love math. That is where my greatest strengths are in, in academia. Uh, and so I, I see great application, but I think you're quite well qualified to answer how does math benefit become a, an important essential part of classical Christian education? Do you want to go first, Sarah, or me? I, or? I mean, we, yeah, we, okay. yeah, we believe it's absolutely essential as the short answer. <laughs> I love how you were putting it, Ma, when we were talking the other day, is the language of the elites these days. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, okay. yeah. I mean, I just believe it is the new Latin. Uh, that the um, back in, you know, medieval times, if you wanted to go to university, you learned to speak Latin, you became fluent in Latin. And today, in academia, whether it's humanities, uh, which is very driven by mathematics today, or it's the hard sciences, it doesn't really matter, you need to learn to be fluent and not afraid of this language. Um, and the be language able to of math. Exactly. Yeah. The yeah. formal logic and the language of math. And uh, so much, so many attacks on the Christian faith are coming from um, this formal language of the elites. Now, I'm not saying it's our, as Christians, it's our language too. We don't need to be afraid of it, um, but we do need to recognize that it's been taken out of context. It's not um, uh, when, when we're teaching it from more of a human, uh, a secular humanist approach, um, it's that it's just, it, it can be intimidating. It can be uh, scary. Um, it can be a, a language that is uh, used just, just so. How do we um, teach it differently sadly. than a secular humanist approach? Well, well you want to take that, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I love, you know, the, the Lewis quote that says, you know, in science, we've been reading only the notes to the poem, but in Christianity, we find the poem itself, you know, this is, you can't really fully appreciate mathematics without seeing it through that lens of a classical Christian worldview, we believe. So, although it's absolutely practical, necessary, essential to have a strong STEM foundation, I don't think you should have to choose one or the other. We need it, but it's also critical to see it from that Christian perspective and worldview. I love being able to pray with the students in the classroom and see it as the language of creation. And when you see it from that perspective, then I believe we can address the culture so much better as my mom is saying there, and we can have a voice in these academic arenas and have solid Christians in those circles making an impact for Christ and his kingdom. Right, sitting in positions of authority because you've passed the, you know, you, you can speak the language and, and, and you're respected for that. Um, I was looking at a scripture verse this morning too, you know, for, for by him all things were created in heaven and earth, visible and invisible. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things and in him all things hold together. That's, it's, it's the language of the wisdom 
that we find in nature and the created order in nature. And that's what we bring into physics and math and really the two tie in together. So that's what yeah. we teach physics and math. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's what we're constantly bringing into the classroom, uh, looking for ways to find and appreciate and give glory to God for the wisdom of his created order yeah. and how he holds all things one together. Of, one of the things that I occasionally run into is a, on that, in that great, a source of reliable information, Facebook, uh, <laughs> is a meme that says, another day and I didn't use my algebra. I know that's not true. I'd like to have you, if you could extemporaneously, illustrate how algebra is used every day by every adult. Right now, as we record this podcast, we are using algebra and math and physics to communicate. Isn't that amazing that we can transmit information at the speed of light? How does that work? How do we transfer the data into sound? How do we convert that? We use that to listen to pulsars out in space as well and radio frequencies. All of these things are math. Did you listen to the radio today? <laughs> did, you, did you log on to your computer? It's all polynomials and sines and cosines waves in the background. So yes, I, every, every well, single- Well, someone one. might argue, yes, but that's the technician, that's the technology. What about me? Thoughts there? Well, I would argue then that um, it's not necessarily, when, when you're learning math, I had one of my students, as a matter of fact, brilliant at mathematics, very, very good at it. And I was expecting him to go on and get a PhD in math. And he said, I, I you know, pushed him, what are you going to go do now? Um, it, he was with me for six years, I think, in school. It was amazing, wonderful young man. And he said, I'm going to go uh, run my parents' farm. Um, so is he going to use that algebra? Yes, it's going yeah, to is. make him a better farmer yeah. because of what it taught him about working hard, about persevering, about grit, about, you know, it's what it does to your character when you do hard things and you do things that you didn't think you could do, uh, when we set that bar high and you jump over it. But taking the farmer example, yeah. he's measuring feed oh, per, cow, per pig. He's calculating that into Absolutely. what he purchases. He's, yeah. he's tracking inventory and needs to order and when. Basic Absolutely. algebra. Today, Sarah, this is where I thought you were going when you first said that and you went very deep, but even at a surface level, at this podcast, we're watching the time of it. We're not going to do a 10 minute, we're not going to do a, a 10 hour, we're watching it and we're measuring that and that that is a mathematical sensibility to get it right. There were, and there was one actually just came to mind, I was looking into you some of the, the proofs that we still don't know how to solve, some, some unsolved problems in mathematics. And guess what? One of the top ones that comes up is the moving sofa problem. <laughs> the moving sofa is a real problem. Look it up. And it's mathematicians are trying to figure out, okay, what is the largest sofa that you can get around a 90 degree corner? That <laughs> hasn't been <laughs> solved? It's unsolved. We don't know. I we feel so know. much better. I just feel <laughs> I was stupid. <laughs> We've got it narrowed down, but I mean, this is important. Moving furniture, for example, you're using, like you said, that mathematical sensibility. And it's actually one of the big, you know, the sofa yeah. constant is a real- That concept. is hilarious. I've never heard that and I love it. That is great. <laughs> well, changing the topic just a little bit, both of you are musicians. Give, it, give the audience a little sense of what you do musically and then answer this question. How does it relate to or overlap with mathematics? Oh, that's a great question. I love it. I actually studied violin performance and mathematics at the same time. And again, this is big thanks to my mom. She was not optional growing up to not learn an instrument. And I'm super- I, I believe that. Mary's tough and I keep my distance. <laughs> and she was so determined we were going to learn violin that she learned it with us. She, this is a reflection of her in so many ways. She learns right alongside her students. She picked up this old violin. We all squeaked away while the dog would hide in the furthest corner of the room. We squeaked away the happy farmer. We were actually crying and she said, let's be happy farmers now, squeak on the violin. 
but it became so much my love and joy through that and persevering. Like you were talking about with the grits, not always easy, but you're so thankful when you get over the hill and then it became my passion. Really, I love music and seeing how that ties in to math and physics. You really, I feel like they're inseparable. <laughs> I, too. I, I came in as a guest at one of my husband's physics lectures and they hooked me up on the violin and could see with the programming what was happening with the harmonics when I was playing on the violin and the different chords you could see, you could visualize the waves that were being created the different equations, the wavelengths, why certain combinations of notes sound really great and others sound really horrible. Is, <laughs> why there, one there, is there a lot of studying that's been done on that that people can find? Oh yeah. Is there? So that's something that we could uh, easily research to get a sense of that. I, Cause I, I, know, I knew there had to be, and I've never really taken the time to research it. I'm glad to hear that that does actually exist. That's where some of my questions were gonna go and you jumped right in there with it. Yes, yes. So we love, I love bringing in some of those live demonstrations into the classroom as well. When we talk about harmonics, for example, alongside trigonometry, sines and cosines and how they stack on top of each other. It's wonderful. Yeah. Are you a violinist as well? Yes. (laughs) <laughs> but mainly flute though, mom, right? Yeah, yes. I play the flute. I I um I could play the basic Suzuki level one, two, maybe, maybe a little into three, but not much more than that. Uh, but I had a lot of fun with it and had a lot of fun. I like to kind of incarnate myself in learning. I like to pretend like I don't know what I'm doing. And I didn't with the violin. There was no pretending there. Uh, but then we all learn together. But when I'm teaching math, it's the same thing. You know, it's like, okay, come on, guys. Here's this historical problem. You were asking, how do you teach? How do you teach um, classically? And I do believe we do look at those big problems that have, you know, what was Newton coming up against when he was trying to figure out uh, the rotation of the planets? It developed calculus. And that's what we need to try to hit those. It's hard. We have a lot of uh, material we have to cover very quickly, but um, to try to get them to understand the problem, try to solve it, before we look at why calculus is a solution. Um, but uh, getting back to the music, um, I, I think if, if I want them to hear a polynomial function, I'll play Bach, uh, just a Bach concerto. Here you guys, listen, listen, this is a, this is a fifth degree polynomial here. <laughs> and let's play it forward, let's play it backward, let's rotate it 180 degrees, let's do this. And music will do that, you can hear the functions. It's Unbelievable. Amazing. I love it that. Is. I, it is. I absolutely love that. Sari, in college, I understand you were on a team that did some mathematical modeling to calculate the spread of Ebola. Tell us about that. Yes. Well, first of all, I've been having flashbacks to that through, of course, the COVID pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> it seemed totally different experience, though, when we were studying Ebola back in, in the day at university. It didn't feel like it was coming our way quite as imminently. And it wasn't the same, but the mathematics was the same and how you are able to track the progress and even model it using, we use some software like NetLogo, MATLAB to model how things might progress, all the different possibilities. We would input data, different variables from the World Health Organization. And I loved it as an example of collaboration as well. I was doing it through the mathematical biology department. And I believe we need more mathematics in biology as well. So I loved that they were doing that, but we had the help of engineering as well. We had the physics department involved. Everybody got together (laughs) and was putting together, hopefully things that would contribute to tracking the progress and hopefully um, helping with the outcome there. Yeah. And give I've been those, really give, about it more recently as well. <laughs> yeah. Give those of us that are not as initiated in that a sense of why tracking the progress helps us control a disease like Ebola. Well, once we have the, the data that's available and we've got a model, then we can hopefully predict what it's going to do in the future. That's the idea. So you, you've got the data, you know, okay, this is the course that it's on. Maybe it's X part of the exponential growth at the moment, or it's leveling off, it's more a logistic model, then you can say, okay, a month from now, here's where we're likely to be at, or even a day from now, or two days. And so now we can, we respond accordingly and hopefully prevent it from going yeah, worse. Get, get the resources on board where you're predicting it's going to come out next. Do, 
do you find, did you find, maybe you weren't as close to this as uh, you needed to be to answer it, but did you find the medical community responsive? And of course, let's say that you find that it's, it's going from one country in Africa to another country in Africa, and some of the things that you do cause that to not happen at all or to the same degree that it might have, did, does then modeling allow you to adjust the modeling so as to build on the improvement to the first forecast? Yes, yeah, constant, we were constantly making adjustments if that helps to answer the question. Yes, so based on what they were doing, we would change the parameters, change the variables. And we were a very small piece of the puzzle but it was fun to be a part of and very exciting as well. And I certainly have been thinking back to it a lot throughout this current pandemic. Yeah. One of the things that I've grown to love so much are well-developed models that are done using technology so that the what if element of, well, if the variable changes here, it has this ripple effect in various things and it allows things like this that are so significant uh, in this case to the health of, uh, uh, the human population to be able to keep up with it. The, the ability when you, uh, I forget the name of the movie with the black women that did the math calculations for NASA. What was the name of the movie? Hidden Figures, was it? Or something like that? Yes. Hidden figures. When they had a change, they were kind of back to the uh, slide rules and, uh, and paper and pencil to recalculate the whole thing again. And technology has allowed us to do that in a split yeah. second in ways yeah. that uh, is are truly remarkable, but it's still required. The genius of creating those technology models requires the people who can build it, and that's yes. that's the value of math in logic, as Mary pointed out, and and uh, in biology, as you mentioned. Well, think about the Dune science fiction movie that's kind of popular right now. Didn't they lose the ability to run their own? Um, uh, nuclear generators and stuff like that. So then they built this whole religion around it, and it was really just it, what was it wasn't. The movie? I don't. I'm not. I believe it. it. I believe it. The book Dune. Um, I, okay. I think it's I'm, Dune. I'm if, if I'm remembering correctly, I think it's Dune. But uh, at any rate, they yeah. lost it. They lost the ability. They didn't because they could go in and run it, but they didn't know how it was built. We yeah. need to know. Yeah. I know you may not have to, my daughter uh, was uh, with the Air Force, she, this is my oldest one, um, she uh, was in charge of satellites. She had to know how that satellite got up there, how it ran. Yeah. She had to know the mechanics of it. She actually just gave it commands and stuff. I mean, she didn't really, um, she's not the one who put it up there, but she had to know that. Yeah. She had to learn how it functioned. Be, um, be the mathematical foundation that shows up uh, in all of these things is, is truly remarkable and, 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 and it so closely connects to our integrated humanities uh, yep. elements that, that get sometimes the main stage in classical Christian education, but it, they can't do without uh, the mathematical uh, basis that you're talking about. I do see that the uh, omnibus is our flagship. You know, it's like that's the flagship going forward. It's the main ship, and and we're we're these little ships following. And 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 math is one, but but man, you need us. We're protecting your side, and and we're a lot of arguments are coming through us. <laughs> you, we need your help too. We need each yeah. other. Um, well, it's got to be both. And I agree with I agree with that, but I think it's even more significant. It's out of math. Yeah. that we can easily understand certain theological concepts. The concept of immutability as a yeah. character of God is, is easily illustrated in the content of two plus two equals four today. It will tomorrow, it did yesterday, and it will forever. <laughs> that reminds me of a student that uh, when I was teaching a Sunday school class, I, I, it wasn't a class I was teaching actually, I was teaching a different class and I happened to walk by the door and I saw this algebra proof on a board. So I walked in there and I looked at it and the kids were all just saying how, because the conclusion was three equals five. And, 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 and so this girl who was visiting was trying to show the kids that truth is relative. 
three can <laughs> equal five. And so she put this algebra proof up there with three equal five. And I just looked at it. I just, and I said, well, yeah, but right here you divided by zero. Um, you know, you can't be absurd. God is never absurd. He will not, and you will get absurdity when you argue from absurdity. Oh, that's you know? so anyway, it that's was, wonderful. it was really one of those moments. Um, I felt a little bad for her because she. <laughs> <but anyway>. um, <laughs> Mary, uh, you you uh, uh, you were one of forty teachers. Yeah. That uh, the Bush George W. Yep. Uh, administration chose to come to Washington for uh, a, a a conference sponsored to deal with disadvantaged youth. Tell us about that. What was the reason you were chosen, and what did you all seek to accomplish there? Well, I think that uh, the way now George W. is the older president, right? Because he was the older Bush. Uh, okay. No, that would be H.W. Oh, then see, I got that wrong when I wrote my profile. Uh, it's H.W. I'm, it's the okay. older Bush. Okay, because <laughs> I'm old. Okay, so we're talking <laughs> okay. about uh, the, the, uh, the conference, right? Yeah, it was okay, phenomenal. Um, what they did was they picked, um, I believe, 20 districts or, or so across the country um, and based on how poorly those districts performed. <laughs> so I was chosen because of my school district, and then my school district, the Long Beach Unified School District, chose me. Man, I was 22 or 23 at the time, wow. um, which I was really impressed. Yeah, I was really pleased with. Um, I was, I mean, I was just amazed. I didn't even know in the, at any rate, getting that opportunity was amazing. So I went there, and um, what, what they really talked about, today we would call it marginalized youth, um, because we, I did. It was a, it was a pretty inner city <laughs> a foreign experience. <laughs> yeah. it, it really pretty amazing when I was in the classroom in Long Beach. So I um, went to this conference and I loved it. What they tried to emphasize was setting up high expectations. If you walk into a classroom and you expect them to jump 10 feet high, they'll do it. Yeah. They, they will do it. Yeah, they I, don't even think they can't. Don't even go there. So, so much. And I couldn't agree with you more. If you look at our catalog and you see what students are reading in fourth or fifth grade, I know, yeah. you're inclined to say as parents, kids can't do that, can they? They can't read 200 of the great books of Western civilization in seventh through 12th grade. They can't all do calculus, can they? And my answer is always the same. They can do a lot more than you think they can if you just don't tell them they can't. Exactly. It's Hello. true. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. No, I just love that. I absolutely agree. Yeah. yeah, because I think sometimes we can fall into the habit as teachers of, okay, the poor little things, they have to meet the requirements. And that is true. There is a little bit to that argument. I don't want to just downplay it completely. But it, and, and I, I don't want, we, we have a lot of kids come in so fearful. But I mean, just expect a lot from them. I went home and I had a remedial math class. I put them in an advanced algebra book. I mean, why not? What's it going to hurt them? And I just expected them to do it. And they did. Yeah. You know, I, I yeah. had to slow it down a little, I, I will admit. But it's still, it was just amazing to me. They were, and they loved it. They, they, well, uh, you can't start a student at a place that they're not ready to start. But where you can take them is a different question and a different answer. Wonderful. <laughs> uh, maybe in closing, this has been so much fun. I could go on for hours. But from a math perspective, what do you think the most important thing is you can teach classically educated students? Do you there want to go first? So many, so many things I don't come to mind. Yeah, I, I would say one thing my mom and I were talking about was not being afraid to do hard things, not being afraid to make mistakes along the way, to persevere. I remember one time in algebra class with my mom way back in the day, the brick wall behind her just exploded. Actually, someone was learning to drive behind, smashed through the wall. <laughs> and thankfully everyone was okay. And after the shock, we're thinking, oh, free homework day, free class day. But actually we worked through it. She taught us a lot about mathematics that day. I believe it was on factoring even. And just <laughs> teaching us, you know, you persevere through things, even a car smashing through a brick wall. And don't be afraid of the challenges along the way. Don't think, oh, I can't do it. Just start right where you are, like you were saying, and then go forward from there and have fun along the way to see the beauty of God's creation. And if we can do that in our classrooms, I feel like that's a huge success. That's really good. 
<laughs> I, and I would just add to that if we have a minute, but just that in, I think the mantra of the, the like the, the verse of the math department should be in him, all things hold together, man, that is just what we are trying to, to teach, to give glory to him, um, because as they learn to be fluent in mathematics, they give glory to him as they see his wisdom unfold and how he holds all things together. It's so beautiful. And um, you, we only get to glimpses. We only scratch the surface. It's like Isaac Newton said, <laughs> he's, it's, you, you're, we at one drop of the ocean is what he, he felt like he knew. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's really good. Well, this has been so much fun. Let me just say in closing to those that are listening to us, if you haven't sensed this by now, let me say it plainly. These two women <laughs> care for students like you can't believe. Their personal touch uh, directly with parents and students beyond the hundreds of, teach of students that they have taught is truly amazing. I have to wonder how many hours in the day they have that I don't have when I see what they accomplish. They, uh, and if you wanna know what your child is capable of in mathematics, they're not the only ones in our organization that can help you do that, but they are clearly two of them and they will cause many, not all, we're never, none of us are successful about everything all the time, but they will cause many children who struggle with and hate mathematics to not struggle and to love it. And we're thankful for what you do for us in that way. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for giving us the opportunity to teach and do the dream yeah. job. <laughs> it's an amazing privilege. Yes. Thank you so much. Well, it's, it's our privilege to be able to work together. This right. is Veritas Vox, the voice of classical Christian education. Thank you for joining us for this episode.